Welcome to Build with Rob. I am Rob Deerdick, founder and CEO of the world's most incredible, amazing venture creation studio, The Deerdick Machine. And you know what we do? We systematically fuse art, science, and magic to manufacture amazing companies. It's what we love to do. We want to master this, so we created a process we call the machine method to create company after company. And this show not only features the founders and the do or die or partners that we create companies with, but it also features aspiring do or dyers that I love to connect with and share advice about their ideas and, and, and sometimes about their lives on, on how to evolve, optimize it. Uh, be better in their business, you know, think about certain ideas in life that may make your life better, more efficient and happier. Um, and today we got a bunch of great, great uh, aspiring entrepreneurs with with some really interesting businesses and a lot of lessons learned. And my life passion is really I just love talking about business and life uh, with everybody. It's, it's something I really enjoy doing. I love sharing uh, sort of the, the, the growth that I've had uh, with other people in, in hopes that I could affect their business or potentially affect their way of life. You know, and, and lately I've been thinking a lot about uh, our machine method and, and sort of the emotional side of creating a business in the stages of business development. And, and really, uh, the concept uh, of product market fit and more than anything, the euphoria of product market fit. How incredible it actually feels when the product and the company is actually working. When you have the right product, right consumer, right distribution, right price, and people are buying it over and over again. Oh, oh. Oh, I mean, there's nothing like it. It's real business. It's the first moment of winning in business. It's literally the most significant win that you have in business and the hardest one to get. And for us, you know, our machine method, our phases, discovery, diligence, build, launch, scale, right? And, and really, you, you could look at this structure in almost anything in life. You know, you, if you're in a relationship, you're going through your diligence, uh, your discovery, you meet somebody, then it's diligence. Do I like them? Then you start dating, you're building, then you decide to be in a relationship and you launch. And then, you know, you go through the chaos of like going, figuring each other out and all this chaos of the, and then you realize I can really be with this person. I'm going to marry this person. Guess what? Product market fit. It's time to scale, right? And, and here's the thing about these stages is they're, they can be incredibly deceiving to a first-time entrepreneur and, and even experienced entrepreneurs. And, and I get caught up in it all the time, right? And because what, what happens is, you know, in the discovery phase when you really like an idea and, and think about the potential of an idea, get the, the excitement starts to build, right? And now, now we're going to dedicate some energy and time into really looking at this idea and validating it and beginning to shape it and turn it into what it could potentially be. That, that happens in our diligence phase, right? So, boy, it's getting all exciting again. What are we doing? We're like, oh, man, this could really work. Oh, this is really white space. Like, oh, this, this founder's amazing. Like, oh, like all this stuff starts to, to really heat up. And, and then it's time, like, you decide, like, hey, let's, let's go do this, right? So that's the first time that an idea becomes real. And because now as an entrepreneur, as us, as, as builders, it's, the, it's where it gets real. Let's go and build this thing. And building is where people get lost, right? Because building is amazing. It's amazing. 
It's amazing. I'm addicted to it. I love it. I, I don't care what we build, what it is. Like when, when we get to that, the, every aspect of it from creating the name to like doing the original design and getting the logos, the look and feel coming up with, you know, all aspects of the financial strategy, the sales strategy, the marketing strategy. How is it going to be a brand is media? Where's the product line extensions? Like, okay, let's get the first product. Here's the first product sample. Like what? 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 How sick is this thing? Everybody's going to love this thing. Test it with the consumers. Oh, what? Consumers love it. Right? It's this euphoric, amazing experience because you're actually bringing something alive. Right? And it's easy to get lost in that process, especially if you keep your idea amongst you, the people you're creating it with and your closest friends that aren't really going to give you the feedback that uh, the critical feedback that you actually need um, to to shape this idea the right way. And you love it all and you think everybody else is going to love it, too. And so you think you're winning. A lot of people and my, I'm I do it all the time and I've had to learn to like stop feeling so amazing when the final product is done and the final packaging is done and like it's like oh this thing's so sick and and falling in love with that moment right like that's not the euphoria that you ever um, want to hang on to or overly appreciate because the truth of what you created happens the moment you launch that thing, right? The moment you launch, you are now in market. And, and that's where things just become the real fight because it's no longer like, oh, it could, it's going to do this and, and speculation and, and all the signs pointing to this, like market conversion, trend conversion, like all these things that, that are like, you know, going celebrity investors, you got, you know, all types of things that are going to make this go. But when you get out into market, like, boy, it gets, it gets deep, dark, murky waters that you got to start paddling through. And, and most people aren't are so on a high from what they created expecting to win when they launch rather than entering launch in this mindset of like i don't know what part of this or how this is going to work but i know i'm going to keep trying testing iterating pushing everything that i can to figure out what about this works, right? And as opposed to being so confident in how you built the business, how you built the brand, how you built the product, right? And, you know, for me, again, I fall victim to it because, you know, I think everything we create is incredible. You know, it's the entire process is amazing. Um, but I have learned to to put a caveat on it, you know what I mean? To put a disclaimer on it, to be like, hey, I think this is incredible, um, but let's see what the market says, you know? And because, you know, you've heard it a million times, it is the truth of all truths. The market does not lie. You know, the market will tell you whether or not anybody wants this on, on in the small dose or large dose, you know? And um, entrepreneurs just have to really... Um, understand that that first milestone to really prove that they have something that can be a real company of value uh, and have a potential of long-term sustainability um, is that, that deep gap between launch and product market fit. And really, it is any and everything that you can do uh, to keep twisting and turning and testing and evolving and trying different things and coming off of big ideas you thought were going to work to reshape them, getting customer feedback, hearing what other people are saying now they've seen it, just pushing it until eventually, God willing, by the grace of the entrepreneur gods, there will now be customers consistently buying it at a clear distribution channel for a clear reason at an appropriate price that is delivering on a clear margin after the cost that it takes to get that sale. And now you got a business, you know, and that 
moment in time when you have learned so much and evolved so rapidly, you know, in, in a 10 to 18 month period that you now fully understand uh, your business and its potential at depth, that is a euphoric moment. So my advice to everybody out there thinking about starting a company, be scared all the way through and try to do as much as you can. And then when you launch that bad boy, do not celebrate how amazing your launch was and how great your brand is and how much your friends love it. Celebrate the moment that you have product market fit because the euphoria of product market fit is one of the most magical aspects of creating a business. Okay, look, we got a great show today. A uh, bunch of great aspiring entrepreneurs. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Good morning to Rob Deerdick and the Deerdick Machine. My name is Leroy Dix. I am 49 years old and I am currently living in Lexington, Kentucky. And today I'm going to show you a patent pending product that I've been working on for the past 18 months. It is, I guess you would classify it in the video game industry. We designed this and invented this thing solely because there's a need for it and we needed one in our own home. Every single console on the planet, including the two new ones, all fit in this thing. It has been designed to, to, to house all consoles to where you can take it with them or to where you can walk in your kid's room at 9 p.m. and go, hey, little Timmy, time for you to get off that thing. Unplug it from the wall, close it up, and take it out of their room in a matter of seconds. With that many people having game consoles and wanting to take them with them sometimes and kids wanting to go to other kids' houses, they, they, a lot of these games are first person, so they go, one kid's watching TV or on his phone while the other kid's playing. They can't play at the same time. It's another problem that fixes. Um, but I feel you got the right team over there and that you guys will know, be able to look down the road a bit and, and, and give us some feedback on this, what we're dealing with. I really appreciate your time today. Um, I hope to hear from you guys soon. Thank you so much. Leroy Dix, welcome to Build with Rob, man. How you doing? I'm good, sir. How are you? Man, tell me about this extraordinary location that you've decided to, to join us from. <laughs> it's my uh, son's bedroom. Man, look, I don't know if your son's an interior decorator, um, but his mother and father have really gone all out to give him an extraordinary <laughs> room because his room looks amazing. Thank you. Tell me about what you uh, have got developed in, in the concept that, that you initially pitched. Lay it out for, for the listeners so they can kind of understand what, what led you to joining the show today. Uh, we kept it simple. We called it the Game & Go case, and it's basically um, to where you can take any gaming console that's been created at this point, and you can take it anywhere you want to go. And then now, is the the console itself has built-in screen? Is it um, is it built to be able to play the entire game in full unit right there? Yes, sir. So you would just plug it in, and you would be good to go. You could play any room, any time, any location, anywhere, as long as you have a plug. Yes, sir. We we even thought about it for uh, TSA as well to get you through there. We haven't we we're gonna take the prototype to the TSA, but. We, you should be able to go right through TSA, no issues. And and ultimately, you know, w when I look at, at the product itself, right, and, you know, it, inherently there's this, here's how my mind works, right, where I look at it and I'm like, okay, um, there's not that many of these, but there are um, a pretty decent amount, right, and in and, and the, and the different types of consoles that are made with the built-in screen and and that always makes me feel two types of way right where it's like okay is it nobody's been able to capture it um or is it that there just isn't the gaming consumer just isn't there at the scale to make it a big business you know and, and i guess when you were looking at at developing this idea like what what where did you see the opportunity and was it because there was so few in the marketplace? And then what, what did you ultimately choose to do to try to differentiate yourself in the market? Um, it, we didn't see anything like it in the market. We saw one that was similar to a briefcase that you would have to carry everywhere. And then, you know, we just made it easier for you to transport this thing and you could take it, like I said, anywhere you want to go with it. And then what did you end up from a price point standpoint from when you did your samples? So we haven't we haven't received the prototype yet. That's one 
going to get to that question here in a second, but it, it's, uh, um, we're still with the prototype that they're supposed to come to prices once you have the prototype. So I will know more. That's a big question. People keep asking and I can't answer. Cause that's essential, right? It's, it's one of the, one of the biggest things, but you know, tell me, tell me about what's, what's going on with, with sort of your process to get the prototype. Um, so when we launched this, we were just looking for a, um, a deal, a, a licensing deal. Right. And so that didn't happen. This product was finished being designed in uh, March of 2020 COVID lockdown. Nobody answered their phone. So every pitch we did, nobody, we, nobody even got back to us. So I was just asked, Hey, what's the next step? And it was, you know, you go into manufacturing and you needed to have a prototype first. So at the beginning of this year, we uh, paid for the prototype. And that really brings me to my first question with you, like what you guys have been dealing with during COVID, any, any prototype things to, cause we're going on a year now and I'm a really laid back guy. So I haven't been, you know, once a month I check in with these guys, I feel like I'm in really good hands, but it, it's just been a long year of something you paid for up front that you wait on. Yeah. And look, I'm, I, I, yeah, COVID's disrupted a lot of different things. Um, but you know, when it, when it comes to prototyping, um, I've found that there's just there's such a world of of lack of responsiveness and like keep pushing you uh, to the back burner as other more significant projects kind of evolve. Right. And and there's just it's just like anything else. There's just some people that are better businesses that do the prototyping than than some. Uh, businesses that just aren't good businesses and if you get caught in one of those that's where you kind of get caught in the like oh we're still working on it like a really diligent one would be give us half up front we'll uh, develop it at this milestone give you all the dates and hit all those dates until it's done um, because they ultimately look at the potential of being your manufacturer as well right so um, to me I, I'm I've also found that the quality of the industrial designer and the company that I actually design the product with um, tends to have better, more vetted relationships in the prototype uh, like industry, right? That allows them to be able to like more efficiently create a higher quality design and get a faster prototype. But that that's been my experience. But I would say if you're, you know, if you've already paid up front and and how far behind are they as far as when they said they deliver it? Well, we've not met any of the the dates of it. There's still a final payment when we get it. You, it's, it was set up exactly the way you just laid it out. So there's a final payment when you receive it. I feel like I'm in really good hands. I just, I'm not a very pushy person. I haven't been very aggressive with this, you know, and I, I, maybe that's a flaw. I don't know. But I mean, look, at the end of the day, your, your entire life's on hold till you get the prototype. You know what I mean? Like your hopes, your dreams, your ambitions, like everything is like, man, I want to create this. We got this idea. You know, I want to put in the work. You know, I was reliable roadside and I got, I had 2 million sales at a hundred thousand people like signed, like I'm ready to get this thing and get it sold. And you're just basically standing still for a year. Right. And it's like, that, Correct. Com that complacency is what I would almost consider like one of the drivers of like the inability to like, you know, even evolve, like grow and find like, you know, happiness because you're kind of always stuck in the mud waiting for this big op this big thing that you want to ultimately go and achieve and do. So, you know, I, I would be as pushy as possible, um, you know, and and just like just give me like, let's reset a date and define it, you know, as, as, as much as you can, because at the end of the day, you got to get that prototype to, to is your proof of concept. Then you got to get the pricing strategy is going to dictate your entire business, right? Because, you know, I hate, I hate going into a prototype without having a price in mind, you know, cause it's like, it's like you get that thing back and it's 700 to make now, now you got to sell it for, you know, 1500, like, and you're 500 above the price of the market where the market's like 500 to 900 of the, the similar ones. You know what I mean? Like, I just think like, you know, that's, that's another thing that I think you got to really like be careful about when, when you look at this product, but you know, I, I think it's super interesting. I think, um, you know, did you like it? I, I really did. I think I, I really liked it from a design standpoint too, right? Of of 
um, you know, it's a nuanced innovation, right? Being able to have that screen pop up and then the having the rollers and now you're able to like, um, you know, like where most of the ones that exist in the marketplace are basically in the opening of the uh, box, right? The carrying case, right? Correct. So, Correct. I, you know, I think I think you really did it. You know, again, my only fear is is pricing and and then market size based off of sort of the existing um, marketplace and how much is offered there. It's, it's that double-edged sword, right? It's like, is it just too expensive where people just wouldn't want to commit to the price to have mobile gaming? Um, or is it just nobody's made one good enough, right? That's the going to be the million-dollar question here. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, and look, and, and I think, you know, one, one thing that I also, that I, that I was really struck by in concept that I haven't really seen out there is just having like a similar case that that didn't necessarily have the built-in screen but had the game ready to go at any any time anywhere from a flexibility standpoint i love this idea of your whole system being to where even if it was in a regular roller case like you could roll it downstairs pull out plug it in and plug it into the tv and now you're playing downstairs like oh you're gonna go to your like now you're gonna go in the basement you can roll it down in the basement oh you're gonna go to your friend's house like like it, it struck me as this this sort of super flexible way to like basically have your gaming system ready to go anywhere at any time. And the difference with that one would be it would be way cheaper because you're only you're only now just making a super flexible carrying case that allows you to move it all over the place swiftly and easily versus like playing it everywhere. Cause that screen is what's going to like drive up the cost of the development. That's probably what's taken as long as well for that. And just so you know, you just revealed plan B. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that is plan B to do it without the monitor. Yeah. And look, I would, I would go with both of them if I was you, you know what I mean? Like options. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like, it's like you take a shot with the big one you know, but you know it's going to end up being really expensive, which just narrows your market so tight. And if you, if you, if you, and you got to target that almost straight to gamers, right? Versus like if you do that super flexible, like move it anywhere in the house, take it to grandma's, take it to the friend's house, like take it on a trip, take it to the hotel, that super flexible version, you target moms now. Right. And now you're targeting moms who are actually people that purchase for these, you know, 15 to 18 year olds. And now it, it like here's the flexibility of this product for mom. She can go in and just take, unplug it twice, close up the case and take it away from him because he's too on the game. Right. Correct. Like, you know, it's like it's it's how you put in the video. It's not as messy everywhere. You know, so look, I'm if I was you, I, I since you've already thought about it, I would do them both. Because, like, why not offer them both? Because they both serve a great uh, value proposition to the consumer. But you hedge, you get to build the brand and do all this work, but you know you can sell way more of the one that'll be way less expensive, easier to manufacture, and ultimately an easier purchase for a more targeted consumer that is a, is a parent, if you will, um, rather than just going after gamers by themselves, you know. I agree with you 100%. Make that happen, Leroy. Absolutely. Leroy. So, so, so now that you know about the stress from all this, and you guys yeah. probably deal with it as well, how do, how do, you, how do you balance all of your, your, your life and work? Like, what are you doing? To, I, I, um, I mean, what, look. What makes your day? I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I designed the life that I wanted to live. That is both time, energy, effort. Um, who I wanted to spend that time with, what, it, how much I wanted to work, all of that stuff. I designed my life, and then I grew into it. I grew into it, and then I got better and better at being more disciplined and having more balance, where today I live this you know, highly optimized, deeply balanced life. But, but part of that is um, I designed the vision for the life I wanted to live, and I, and I became it. Right. And part of that vision um, and part of that realization of that vision uh, was dealing with the highs and lows and the pains 
of not making progression towards my goals, right? So, you know, yep. when you, I know when you're sitting in this period, you basically got to go through pockets of feeling good because the whole thing can't actually, it's not, you're still in the hero's journey of being in the fire of just the, the build side. You know, and because most uh, the journey is, you know, you, it's like, oh, I want to do this. Then you go through the process of researching like, oh, this is a good idea. Then you then you figure out how you're going to do the whole thing. And now you're going to build it. And right now you're in a very painful wait period <laughs> that usually doesn't exist during the build phase. This phase is supposed to be all exciting. And this is amazing because when you launch that product, that's when the real pain begins because then you get this thing into market and you're like, how come nobody's buying this? Like this thing's amazing. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, I think it's just the reality of, of, you know, spend your time learning everything you can right now about the industry that you're entering because that knowledge is going to pay dividends to you when you finally launch the product. I think that, you know, one way to get real clear is to just really look at, you know, like who you are, you know, sort of what you need out of this business in order to be fulfilled and it be a success for you. And, you know, call it, hey, if we could sell three million a year and make, you know, 500,000 in profit, you know, 300,000 in profit, like that would be huge for us. Like figure out what your baseline goal is and then build a plan with your business to reach that, you know, whatever that number is, uh, as it relates to the lifestyle that you need to support, you know what I mean? Like really think through all of that so that like you can see in the future when all of this works and comes together, how you will live a balanced and and fulfilled life with purpose growing into it with your company working and all this stuff happening rather than spending all your time stressing about like um about whether or not it may work right and then just having these pockets of feeling good and balanced when things are moving forward or you find a moment of peace and then drifting right back into negative thoughts and like, I don't know, and all the doubt and everything that's going in and maybe it works like, yeah. you know, because, yeah. you know, for someone like me, it I realized that you basically live between a few states. You're either uh, like negative thoughts or, or dwelling or thinking about the past. You're either problem solving. You're either experiencing the present. You're either ideating and creating the future or you're being super hopeful. And sitting in a state of hoping and wishing is pointless because it's getting you nowhere. Sitting in a state of dwelling and, and thinking of the past is getting you nowhere. So you either got to be taking action to problem solve, living and experiencing the present, or you have got to create the future. You know what I mean? So take this time right now to, to, to be creating the future, problem solve and get this uh, prototype, have an A and a B plan and go make this thing work, man. I look forward to, to, to seeing you have a great amount of success, you know what I mean? I really appreciate your, this opportunity, Rob. Thank you for bringing us on your platform. Okay. Good luck to you. I look forward to, to catching up with you in the future once that thing's ready to be sold. We've got some other things as well, so we'll be, be in touch with you. Okay. All the best. Be good. Hi, my name is Travis Chapel. I grew up in a small town in Southern California called Lancaster and probably a little bit different than most kids in Southern California because I grew up on this in this religious bubble type of community. The cool thing about what we're building is that it wasn't me building a solution and then searching for a problem. It was a problem that I was experiencing as a podcaster because as a podcaster, it's really difficult, especially if you're starting from scratch like so many people are to get those really high quality guests that can really move the needle for your brand, bring in huge credibility and authority and help you create super high quality content that engages your fans and allows you to build your audience better. The bottom line is it's difficult to go get those guests. And I know because I've been there and I've done that and I've tried to go through the gatekeepers and I've tried to go through the talent agencies and uh, it just takes months and months and months of reach out. We've done a lot of trainings on that for some of our podcasters in our communities, but the bottom line is there just needed to be an easier, more streamlined way to get high quality guests that you really wanna interview on your content platform, whether that be a podcast, a YouTube channel, a blog, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when we came up with Guestio. Guestio is just like Cameo, but it's for 
booking interviews instead of booking a 30 second happy birthday shout out. So you can actually get conversations with the people that you really want to get to know onto your podcast or onto your content channel without having to go through three years of reach out like I have literally done for some of my guests that I brought onto my show. Guestio is the all-in-one guesting marketplace that allows shows to book high quality guests and allows guests to go book high quality show appearances for their book tours, for their movie releases, and for anything else that they might wanna generate press, media, or listener attention for. If, if there's anything that I can take away from my years of door-to-door, -door, from my years of podcasting, from struggling to work my way to the point where I am right now, it's that persistence, consistency, and being willing to do the work that nobody else is willing to do is ultimately what separates the, the, the winners and uh, from everybody else. It's ultimately what creates that do or die mentality. And if there's anybody that embodies that, I promise you it's me. Uh, give me a shot and I'll show you what I can do. Travis Chappell, welcome to Build With Rob, man. How you doing? Doing well, brother. How are you? Hey, look, I, can you just first just lay out for me sort of uh, and for the listening audience, uh, as you know, because you are coming live from a podcast studio. I feel like this is how like modern podcasts happen. You know what I mean? My view is yeah. you is like you're on a giant screen with a mic and I'm on a mic. It feels like you're a guest in my studio. You know what I mean? That's true. So That's please, true. please uh, lay out sort of your concept and, and, and sort of what you what you pitched us in the company that you're building right now. Yeah, man. So it's called Guestio. Um, I got the idea because I'm a podcaster. I've been podcasting now for a few years. Uh, we're coming up on 700 episodes and uh, been able to interview some really high quality folks in the space that I'm in. And uh, throughout that time, I started helping out entrepreneurs and other business owners with their branded content with podcasting and things like that. And one of the questions that kept popping up all the time was, how did you go get that person on your show? How did you get in front of so-and-so? How did you interview this person? And, uh, and the answer is that it takes a ton of hard work and persistence and blowing or, you know, through gatekeepers and, and trying to find introductions to people. And it just takes a, a really long time. Not a lot of people have that much time to dedicate to it. And so I just was like, this is clearly a problem for people, <clears throat> but there's no product on the market that exists to help give people that kind of access. And uh, so I tried to look for one, didn't find anything and figured, hey, why don't we go ahead and create something? So we ended up building a, a product called Guestio. And uh, it's essentially like a, a marketplace full of guest profiles that you can go on and uh and pitch them to be on your podcast youtube channel any other content channels you have if you're running a virtual event they can speak at that if you want them to do a mini endorsement for your company you can do that uh, for your marketing or ad campaigns you can pay them to do that um, so there's basically any sort of guesting that you want from somebody um, to to do, to put out there for your marketing for your content that you're working on for more credibility or authority or status or whatever it is you can go to Guestio find them and book them there directly it's kind of like Cameo but for booking interviews rather than booking you know thirty second happy birthday shout out and yeah because Cameo is um you know look my my wife uh, got a Cameo birthday shout out from a friend of mine uh, from Chris Harrison uh, from The Bachelor yeah and he committed. It was so thoughtful. He committed. But then I'm like, man, like, how can you, how, you know, I look at all these cameo guys. I think to myself, like, how could you be spending the time um, for like a hundred bucks to like, yeah. do? and now there's like this weird video of you, you know, they've hit me up for years and I'm like, it's, I can't even like fathom somebody having the time or thinking it's a good <laughs> idea to do some silly shout out. And it was very thoughtful from Chris Harrison. You know what I mean? I'm very thankful. Yeah. And look, so so tell me about sort of the status and in, in, in the current um, progress and, and status of the business. Yeah, so uh, we started developing in uh, June or July of 2020 um, and then opened it up to basically just my soft, you know, uh, pitch audience, my warm audience, my friends that I've made in the industry, um, mutual friends, Jordan Harbinger, Chris Harder, Lori Harder. Um, some of these, some of these people that, that I've known for a little while. And, um, and then we started getting some traction, started getting some users, and then we just have been in straight up feedback and iteration mode for the past six or seven months, just connecting with people, asking them what we should build, what we shouldn't build, what features they like, what they don't like, and, uh, just been making tweaks to the platform. And so now we've, we've grown completely organically now to about 2,500 users, um, on, on the platform. And by and users, you mean, um, the, the, 
the harders and the the different people that are like for you can <clears throat> bookable request guests, books, bookable guests, right? Bookable guests or shows. So it's a dual sided marketplace. So you as a guest can go on and pitch shows to go on. So you can, you know, bring more traffic into your offers, your products, your services, whatever it is. And then you as a show can go book guests. And then ha- and then how does it? Because cameo the cameo business model is clean as a whistle. Right. Mm -hmm. Like everybody sets their own price. Cameo, you request it. They shoot it. Cameo gets a piece. Right. So same exact thing. Right. So so when it goes the other side, would it be like, hey, uh, you know, I'm billed with Rob and I want Ray Dalio. I'll give you like twenty five thousand to come on the show type of thing. So you can make an offer to uh, someone to potentially be on the show or do they set their price? Do they set their price? So yeah, every guest that comes into the marketplace can set their own price uh, for what for whatever bookings they have. So that we have six different booking types. You can book a, a, a podcast interview. You can book a virtual event speaking spot. You can book something that we coined uh, called a mini view. So if you want to be able to talk to Ray Dalio, but you don't have twenty five grand to book him, uh, you can do this little mini view option where we uh, made it to where it's three to ten questions that you can ask somebody. You pull up your phone, you ask one question, submit it. Ask another question, submit it and so on and so forth send those over to them and then that way they don't have to be sitting down and like you and i are doing right now we they don't have to pick a time be sitting down live in a studio with a microphone and a lighting and lighting and cameras and all that stuff they can pull it up whenever they want to and answer the questions that you ask them and then you can download that that audio content or video content stitch it all together and turn it into a mini interview on your podcast your youtube channel your instagram your tiktok whatever and so you as a guest when you create your profile you go in and select which bookings you're available for and how much you want to charge for each of those booking types um, so it leaves it completely into the hands of the person that's that's being booked. So how much does Manny Pacquiao charge me for a so, podcast interview? So Manny Pacquiao currently charges about fifteen thousand dollars for for a thirty minute I think Zoom call interview. It's amazing. Um, but, Look, uh, I mean, but, as somebody that can't even like fa- like I would be equally as embarrassed of being <laughs> on a platform where it's like you know I, I feel like you know podcasts are like this this super great sort of way to just like ideate and and basically be philosophical depending on what the 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 type of show it is right um but the idea of like charging people to come on the podcast is really funny to me and it's it's funny to me today but i know that like it's going to be like um the that the pendulum is going to flip where it's like the podcast gets so big where it's like the only way like for people big people to come on it's not about promotion anymore it's a it will be about like them driving downloads and really pushing the podcast itself so it's super interesting but but look i i it's you know interesting to me right and obviously like you know you're 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 you know, you're deep in, in the world, whether it's like, you know, your own podcast and helping people build podcasts or even like your list of advisors and partners or, you know, you know, the hundred million Academy, like, you know, you're in all, you know, you know the harder, you know, you're in, you're in there with everybody inside sort of the universe, you know what I mean? And, and to me, you know, when I think about like the market for booking podcasts, yes, it's a pain point, like, um, for the podcast market, but, and yes, everybody has a podcast now, but it's still very small, right? It's still (laughs) like, it's still relatively small of a, of a total market, like as it relates to the, the having the right person on the platform and then, um, and then a guest wanting to book that right person. And then there being enough of a fee in there to, to be able to eat off of it, that builds a business. But I think the promotion side, this like idea that you can be, you know, Tony's Pizza in Newport Beach and Sylvester Stallone will be like, hey, hey, what's up? I got to tell you right (laughs) now, I ain't never had a better pizza than Tony's down in Newport. I tell you what, when I'm ever I'm in the city, I love the pizza. Like, like to me, that is there's like this immense amount of scale and potential in that right like that's well, so much bigger than like just guest speaking or guest podcasting yeah you're, you're, you're totally right and that is kind of you know over the last few months of 
gathering feedback and data from customers. That's really what we've been seeing. The people that have spent the most money on the platform are the people that are looking to do more things like that. And we just struck a deal yesterday with a a billion dollar solar company that wants us to go out and get a bunch of people like that to do those types of endorsements so they can send it over to their ads team and create better ads for it. We have another e-commerce company that's going to do about 300 million this year that's looking to spend a good amount of money with us just for us going out and facilitating those kind of uh, we're, we're calling them mini endorsements because it's not a full on, you know, commercial shoot or anything. But if you can get a 30 second clip of somebody that is, you know, in your area, people that, you know, people that are your customers know, like, and trust that person, we're, it's basically just buying endorsements, which has been something that's been around for decades. And, you know, Nike spent over $6 billion. They spend over $6 billion annually on sponsorships and endorsements because it works and it uh, facilitates trust with their, with their audience. And, so we're having a quite a few companies that are really interested in having us do um, those types of things. And that's, to be honest with you, Rob, that's why we named it Guestio at the beginning. Cause uh, you know, I was going back and forth on like, should we call it like, you know, pod guest or something about podcast and mixing guest with it. But then at the end of the day, I was just like, this is so, this concept is so much bigger than podcasting and sure. That's what I might use it for. And I know some friends of mine will use it for that. But beyond that, the, 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 the market is so much bigger than that. It's, it's so much bigger than just podcasting. And then what, what, what questions did you have for me? I know you had some super interesting questions and one of the second one I know has got to be what you ask guests on your podcast. Every, every single one of them. Yeah. That we've done almost 700 episodes and there's only one question that we've asked to every guest. And that's the, that's that one. So yeah. So hit me with, what was the first question? The first question is, uh, for an early stage startup, what, what core activity or activities do you think you should spend the most amount of your time on? Because, you know, time is so precious, got so much stuff to do. And sometimes, you know, you can, you can be doing so many things in a certain, in a given day or a given month. What, what activities are the top priority? I, I mean, I think obviously it's always dependent on what the business is. And it's like, what's driving, what is the, the number one thing that drives the most value, right? And, and to me... What is that? What do you think that is for your business? I'll tell you what I think it is. What, what do you think the number one? What's driving the most value for your business in your mind? Well, up to this point, it's been investors, but we just closed out our round a, a couple of weeks ago. And so now it's mainly focused for me on the uh, the inventory on the guest side of the marketplace to be able to bring in as many of those high quality people, influencers as celebrities, athletes uh, that we can. Cause I think that if we can build up the, the demand or the supply side of the marketplace, that the demand side will kind of come along as we continue to build it. That it, the way that I see it is, is kind of what I was thinking. So to me, that's a hundred percent what it is. You're only as good as the inventory, right? And, yeah. and it's, it's simplifying, the story, right? Like of that it is like, get these people to promo for you. I think you got to lean into that extra hard. And, and then it is however many people you have on there, then you're going to have to use that money to start spending, um, in order to, to, in, in, it makes sense, right? Like where you're spending money to uh, uh, trying to convert people onto the site where the actual people they would want to hire to promote what they have. There's, there's sort of a connection there that I think you have to really fully understand. Um, and then it's your metrics, right? Like getting, getting, understanding sort of your growth metrics. That is the number of quality people that are on there, number of, uh, you know, promos per month, like really getting your KPIs in order because, okay, you got everybody invested in this round on the vision. And it's like, now you have to have these super defined like even if they're small growth metrics, okay, we added 200 new like celebrities to our inventory. We sold, you know, 500 new uh, promos and drove revenue by 25%. You just want growth because at growth, you can, you can, you can call your price anything. Like what price did you raise the round at that you just closed? Uh, we raised through a, through a safe, like kind of a convertible note yeah. minus the note. And the value cap for the first million was five million in, in the safe, and then for the last half a million, it was seven point five. Yeah, so so you know, all fair numbers, right? Like, and 
and reasonable at this stage, right? At that 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 number. But you can get away with almost any number beyond here um, that you're going that you because here's the path you want to take, right? You want to show month over month growth so that you can point to uh, a run rate two years from now and be like, this is how big it's going to get. You've got to get the metric of this is how many bodies we're putting on. Like, you know, in, you know, it's. I wouldn't call it like, you know, it is return on ad spend here, but not quite the the, the same as what I'd consider more traditional uh, sure. return on ad spend. But you really have to like, like figure out a proof point of like, if we had 5 million, we would spend it and it would, it would drive this growth like this type of thing. So to me, it's focusing on those key value drivers and then growing them before you run out of money. Right. Like that's that's your number one focus, because at the end of the day, if you can prove those, anybody will keep giving you money to go realize the vision, you know. Yeah. And basically and so simplifying the message down to more of the promo endorsement style uh, things rather than uh, the guest bookings and then filling up the inventory and finding people to start buying the inventory. That's it. That's it. And, And think about that. Like when you think about like all the people that would need podcast guests. Think about it in your head. It's like 10,000 people. You know what I mean? When you think about who are all the people that would want to shout out for their business from a celebrity, it's millions of people. You know what I mean? And and so it's just like, you know, sometimes the value proposition and the scale of the business connecting is kind of gray and hard to see, but this one is clear as day. You know what I mean? Like it does not get any clearer than that. Hit me with the podcast question, man. Hit me with the podcast question. Let's do it, man. I've asked this question to hundreds and hundreds of people, and I'm super curious to hear what your answer is. Um, Of these two, which is the more important asset in life? Who you know or what you know? Of these two, what is more important in life? Is it who you know or is it what you know? Um, I don't even think there's a question. Uh, in my mind, you have there's no value in who you know, uh, zero, if you don't uh, have some sort of value, uh, some sort of knowledge, some sort of expertise, some sort of opportunity, some sort of development, something that you've created, what you know, what you learned, what you've done, what you've evolved into, the value as a product, value as a person, value as a relationship is the exchange in who you know. So if you, you know, and you know, it's a really good example in my mind, like wealthy children. Wealthy children with extraordinary access and and wealth and all these things that twiddle their thumbs and are sad and like don't know what to do in life. Like it's a perfect example of when you ha- you can have an extraordinary network, but if you don't if you can't create value um you'll never be able to maximize that network. And you can only gr- create value through what you know. You know what I mean? It doesn't manifest out of nowhere. You know what I mean? And I think Fair that's enough. an easy one. But look, I'm going to tell you right now, um, have you ever attempted to reach out to me to be on your podcast? Um, you know, I think I, I think I probably have on Instagram. Instagram DMs is where I do all of that stuff. Yeah. So uh, if, if you checked, <clears throat> if you checked my DM to you in like your request folder, there's probably something there. I probably have. Yeah. Well, look, I don't, I don't want to be presumptuous um, because I was just, I feel like we align too much as it relates to your community and sort of my growth mindset and my sort of. Um, um, mindset as a whole i'd be sad if you didn't if you didn't get in my dms to invite me but look as as a as an exchange in value uh i would love to be on your podcast as as part of uh going through this experience together as well oh i'd love to have you man that'd be awesome okay look man keep pushing i think you really got something when you when you focus it and and lock in on those metrics man and prove that value so that you can keep raising money and build something special and have somebody acquire it and go on and live your extraordinary life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the plan. <clears throat> I appreciate it. All right, appreciate be good. It. Rob, thanks for having me. Take care. Hi, Rob. My name is Corey Klein. I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I'm chief of innovation for Klein Products. Klein Products is a creative solutions company. 
Our goal is to design products that solve everyday problems and bring them to life. And the idea that I want to pitch to you guys today is called Salty Storage. Now, it's like something like this. When you walk into an entryway of a business, you'll see a 50 pound bag of salt a lot of times. And my idea was born because I would see this bag of salt and think why not have the salt contained by almost like this, but an actual salt shaker. So it's a cute, fun idea. And um, to get a design made would cost a $1,000. And I would then need funding and marketing help to get the product manufactured and out to the public and to try and get it into store. Um, my Instagram is dry mascara solution one. So please check it out. We can get a better idea of who I am. And um, I'm so passionate, but passionate about bringing products to life. I really can make anything happen. I am do or die day and night. I would be an excellent member to your team. Hope to hear from you guys. Corey Klein, welcome to Build with Rob. How you doing? What's up? Tell me about your your product concept. You know, the one that you pitched us. You know, we can get into dry mascara, but I'd love to kind of hear like what what your idea was when you pitched it to us in the first place and why you decided to pitch it to us. Okay, the dry mascara solution or the salty storage? The salty storage, because really the salty storage is what you pitched us as a product concept. I'd be, I'm just curious of why, why that product um, and why us? So why the salty storage? In general, I love to develop any product. So I put all my money, all my time into this dry mascara solution. So um, it actually expired in July. It had a two year shelf life. So my goal was just to shoot more ideas to you that I love and that I know I could bring to life and that I see um, an area in the market where this would actually work. And I just wanted to throw it your way. And, and so in concept, it is what? Like having a more fashionable way to store salt uh, and at, at restaurants and hotels, what's the vision? Right, so when I walk into restaurants, doctor's office, apartments, buildings, I see this random bag of salt in the entryway. And whether you live in Beverly Hills or Buffalo, New York, when you walk into a room, you know when it feels good and squared away. When you walk into this entryway and you see this bag just awkwardly thrown, there's no presentation involved. And I feel like that could be done better. And, um, also fit that liability that the business owns for keeping their sidewalks maintained. Yeah, and, and look, you know, for us, it's like a tough business, right? Because it's single product, seasonal. Um, you gotta like, yeah. you know, it, it's, when we look at an idea, it's like, okay, here's the one product, but what can it, what can the product line scale into, right? And then uh -huh. how big is the consumer base? And it's just, Something like that has just such a small market and then it's seasonal and then it's like it it's it doesn't have any scalability. Right. So, you know, even for you as such a hustler of like, you know, designing and doing all types of products like I, I would I would always be looking towards things that have more scale, you know, because even okay. even even dry mascara. Right. You're you know, okay, we know how big beauty is, right? And we know how many people buy mascara, but the, the problem is, is a mascara is, you know, $20, right? And like a, a mascara has a three month life anyway. And most people put it in boiling water to try to get it stirred up a little bit to get a little bit out of it for nothing before they just go buy another one, right? So again, you got the hustle, the drive, and the ability to see stuff all the way through. It's about identifying the opportunities that are either like in the right space or the right product to be able to capitalize on your energy and abilities. You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like you keep choosing products that are much harder to win with. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
See, with the mascara, I guess my idea was um, just to be for the woman that's working the 16-hour shifts and have to be up again at 8 a.m. And um, the application was better, and it was um, cosmetic-grade dye versus just oil and water. And so there was a better application. So um, I think you made great points, and um, it's just... The idea is I love to throw them around, so to hear your feedback is the best. It's awesome. Yeah, and look, and it's also like the market tells you the feedback the most, right? And I think like when you get a product into market and you have trouble selling it, like that's when you know it's not a right fit. The consumer isn't connecting with it for some for some reason or another. Um, right. You know, I, I, it's, it's the creating a product's amazing, exciting, building the brand, getting the sample, getting it for the first time. It's a thrill of a lifetime. But the truth is told in that first like year, like because you at first you're trying to sell it. But if you can't find, you know, we call it product market fit, where ultimately here's the consumer. This is why they would buy it, what, what they would pay for it and how many people buy it. If you never find that, you just don't have a business um, and it's, and it's time painfully to try to find something else to try to, to, to make happen. But, uh, you had a couple questions for me. I'd love to, to hear them. All right. So I was wondering, um, what aspect of market research is most important to you before moving forward with the development phase of a product? Yeah. I mean, it's, there's developments probably a little bit like more, more, mature right because if you're going to spend the time and energy and actually create a product um, then you got to really know the market right to me we do these we call it the discovery phase and we do what we call an immersion where we look at the consumer all of the competition all of the market all the pricing strategy we look at everything so that we can gather some insight to be like okay you know there is a market for this and this is the best price for that and this is where it sits in the marketplace and this is where it should be sold and who should buy it we try to do all that before we ever actually make a part product because otherwise you're just completely guessing and you're going off your own gut instinct and there'll be so many times that i'll be like this is amazing this is such a good idea this could be such a big business and then you go and look at the market and you see all these other like failed attempts to make the same product or some that are in business that are super small. And then you begin to see like, oh, wow, there really just isn't a market for that, you know? So we really love to be able to look at the whole market and have an idea of what's the right pricing strategy and position of that product before we ever go into development, right? Because that yeah. gives you all the insight. You want to do as much failing as you can it through research before you spend a dime right and then once you develop the product then you want to go and test that with potential con consumers and what would you pay for this and what do you think about this and and retailers like would you ever buy this you want to you want to get as much feedback as possible so that by the time you go to market you now have basically all the things that would have caused you to fail once you got to market you did before you actually started spending a lot of money to actually build the company that that's the best way to use sort of research and sequence because at the end of the day like it's really hard to build a business and you want to give yourself you want all the pitfalls that you could possibly fail at to happen before you actually launch it uh, is what we've learned over the years, you know. Right. Easier said than done. But nothing that a Google search can't do. Because even for me, when I was like, oh, dry mascara, let me, let me look at the mascara world. I just Googled and I went through all these different re reports. I was looking at pricing strategy and mascara. I was looking at all the feedback on how to, how to, how to, to fix dry mascara. And then I began to triangulate my own insight that was really just more of like, man, you're talking about a $20 product that only lasts three months. And so the, the natural purchase behavior would be buy another mascara as opposed to rejuvenating mascara, especially how much were you charging dry mascara? Um, 
It was all. It was ranging from nine ninety nine. We'll say on Etsy. Yeah. So it's like it's like now it's like nine ninety nine or buy a new one, right? Like that's the right. But my product did have a two year shelf life, and I'm telling you, mascara it has a ninety day life, and yeah. it would never last ninety days. Yeah. So it was keeping that product fresher is what I was most proud of. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that. I like that as a position too. See and see that that's kind of how. So, like, to me, when you think of a value prop, if it was, like, fresh mascara, like, make sure your mascara is the best it can be every day. Now it's, like, here's a supplemental product to make sure you're getting the most out of your mascara. Because right now you sold it as, like, hey, it dries out. Like, here's a thing to help it. Like, which which then kind of like fights that three month rather than make your mascara better than like realize its whole potential. If you're thinking about maybe repositioning that thing, I would think about it. You know what I mean? It could be an interesting way to uh, uh, approach it, but I don't know. I think there's, that's a super, super interesting way to do it too. Okay. Do you have any other questions for me? Um, just, um, <laughs> it, what gave you the will to keep moving forward when, um, when doors were shutting on you and no one was really seeing your vision? Look, I, 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 I balanced like continually being driven to the vision, but listening to feedback. So I wouldn't just feel like, oh, you just don't get it. Anytime a door would be shut, I would try to dissect their feedback and understand it and try to evolve my vision further. And by growing continually, and you you continue to evolve and push forward and then finally the right door will open at the right time uh but there's no doubt um when you get a lot of closed doors it's very difficult for a sustained period of time you really you really got to second guess your overall idea if it happens for us an extended amount of time and you've done everything you can to try to evolve it um that you just kind of kind of uh, rethink sort of what you're going for, but there's no doubt progression towards the vision will always be what keeps the energy inside you. You know, for sure. Awesome. Okay, well, look, I, I I appreciate the time with you. I wish you the best. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, take care. All right, there you have it. Man, we're knocking them out down here at Build with Rob. You know, I, I just, I marvel. I marvel every time I, I, I do these shows because I absolutely love it. I love getting into the energy with an entrepreneur and like shaping everything. Like, oh, this is what it is. And I always leave like, man, like, like they can really do this. This is going to be amazing, you know? And um, I love it. I absolutely love it. So look, um, you want to jump on with me? Uh, get my thoughts on your company, your idea, you know, head over to DeerDeckMachine.com and, and, and jump on and pitch us an idea. Uh, you know, you want to be a part of creating these companies with us, go to DeerDeckMachine.com, become a machinist. Join us on this journey. Be a part of our feedback loop. Help us make better companies. Um, of course, as always, you know, hit us hit us with that, that, that like button wherever you're uh, listening to the podcast subscribe to the youtube do whatever you can to live in the energy and the knowledge that we're spewing down here at the deer deck machine and look i, I don't know what to tell you you know if, if you don't got a vision if you can't see it uh, you know it, it, it's just never gonna happen you know what i mean like if, if you don't actually even think it's going to guess what it ain't never gonna happen if you don't got the work ethic, the wherewithal, the grit, the determination, the fortitude, and the ambition, probably not going to happen. But if you want to make it happen, have all those and push it to the edge. Till next time, see it, believe it, do it.